praises for that one. Let's see, it seemed like I had another one marked here. Connie, number seven up there, my, my cousin Connie, she starts um, her radiation this week. So uh, we saw her today. Um, I think her radiation is Friday, her first radiation treatment. So y'all y'all pray for her if you would. No, she's doing it here. Mm -hmm. My cousin Connie up there, number seven, Connie Freeman. Yeah, she's... And Wesley's sister, he just gave me an update on her. Shirley, she just got out of same rehab Jack just got out of in Compass. Uh, and she's, she's doing a little bit better also. Shirley started at number four up there. Uh, he just gave me an update on her. So uh, that's also a praise. Um, only other thing I think we added this week is on focus prayer request to pray for our Teachers, students, administrators for school starting back. So teachers, administrators are back. Kids come next week. So uh, be in prayer for that. It's always a, a, a big time for all of them. I think that's my updates. Okay. Yes, ma'am. Okay. Uh-huh. Oh. Good. Good. That's a, a good praise report. We like those. All right. That's number 15 on, on there, y'all. Uh, that's Sandra's neighbor, Ray Mack. Okay. What else? Updates, requests, names you want to add. We did add a couple from last week uh, that J.D. put on here, Brooke Hoffman and Gail Christ, uh, that he added last week. One of them has heart issues. Um, and I can't remember what the other one was. I have it written down in there on my other sheet from last week, but that's 31 and 32, so y'all do keep them in your prayers too. Okay. What else y'all got? To pray for specifically. Do what? Oh, okay, yeah. Okay. What else? Other other requests or names you want to mention? We don't have anybody in the hospital right now that I'm aware of. Um, I mean, I think the ones that are there had surgery and are supposed to go home. So um, I think we want to continue to pray for the Circes, number 20, for Tom Royal, number 18. Keep him in your prayers. Uh, Mike Bennett, number 21, is always one to keep on our prayer list. I think we need to continue to pray for uh, Patsy Jackson. Uh, she's recovering, but I think her recovery has been hard. Uh, just her toleration of medic medications and stuff. So uh, those are all just, you know, some, some names kind of that we need to... Uh, Pat Shoemaker, you all continue to pray for her. She's still in recovery mode, possibly pace place... Uh, facing another knee replacement. Um, anything else y'all want to put on here? Uh, pray for our nation, of course, and our leaders. Uh, pray for the situation in the Middle East. Pray for Israel. That's on here. Of course, pray for our church and all of the programs and leaders and things like that going on in the life of our church. Uh, we do have a list of them uh, on there um, over on the top left-hand side for you to Remember who to pray for there. Um, all of our shut-ins, uh, keep them in your prayers. Anything else y'all want to put on here tonight? Anybody? Okay, Rosemary has an unspoken request, so you can just write her name down there. Okay. 
okay? Stephen has unspoken also, Stephen Klopp. Anything else y'all have on your heart tonight you want to put on that prayer sheet? All right. Um, why don't we take a moment to pray? I always like to give us an opportunity to just kind of pray silently over the list, even if it's just going before the Lord and calling out a name. That's a, a great uh, way to do that and, and uh, intercede for these folks on our list. And uh, so then let's take a minute just to pray silently. And then, Denny, would you mind voicing our prayer for us tonight if you wouldn't mind praying for us. So let's pray silently together for just a moment and then Denny can lead us. Amen. Amen. All right. Thank you, guys. Um, hang on to that list, and let's keep these folks in our prayer. We'll take a break just for a little bit. We've got some time for you all to visit and share a little bit, and then we'll get started about 630 with our Bible study. Yes, ma'am. Okay.
I'll go ahead and start this prayer letter around tonight for us. We just have one this evening, and it's for um, Effie Reese. Um, Effie is um, getting ready to start um, dialysis, so she's had a port put in and uh, kind of going through that process, which is kind of rough. So that's just an encouragement letter for her tonight. So we'll we'll start that one. Nancy, are we close to ready, you think? Can we? Huh? Nah. It'll be all right. We're just a couple of minutes early. Hi, Robin. Come on in. Good to see you. Ta-da. Everyone, please stand. <laughs> I'll try to remember to do that next time. <laughs> yeah. All right. Grab your Bibles. Um, if you've got your copy of the Scripture, we're going to be in the third chapter of John tonight as we kind of continue on our uh, study through First John. Yeah, First John. Um, by the way, if you if I know sometimes you know you, you can't you don't some people don't get to make it every week and uh, these studies are all on um, they're archived on our Facebook page so you can go back to the date you missed and you can actually watch the uh, live stream of it because so they're all archived and then the study is also on our website if you if you um, want to download the manuscript of the actual study uh, those are put on the website every week so. If you miss one of them and want to go back and get those, all of that stuff's available to you. And so I know some people have never really explored all those things that we have, and I, we don't talk about them much, but there's lots of resources out there for you to pick this stuff up if you, if you want to go back and catch up with where we are. So uh, we're in the third chapter of First John uh, in, our, in a study that's really covering these three little letters uh, that the Apostle John wrote towards the end of his life. Uh, that you kind of find tucked right back towards the end of your New Testament uh, before you get to Revelation. And um, we're in the third chapter right now, um, so uh, we're going to be looking at verses 4 through 10 tonight um, in, a, in a tough study, I think, one that has a lot of questions with it, one that's pretty challenging, I think, for us to read. There's some, uh, you know, John, John makes some statements uh, in these letters that have caused some controversy. We're going to hit on one of those tonight, kind of talk about um, what, he, what he means by that. Uh, remember that uh, John is actually a letter uh, that is written by the Apostle John. There's no reason to doubt that authorship, really, um, although uh, the, the letter of 1 John doesn't have an inscription on it. Uh, most of Paul's letters, you know, uh, do bear his name. It'll, it'll have an inscription on it. 1 John does not have an inscription on it, but it is attributed to the Apostle John, um, he also wrote the Gospel as well as Revelation, plus these three letters. So he's the second most prolific writer in the New Testament. Um, these, these letters are interesting because of when he wrote them, towards the end of his life. Um, they're almost um, kind of sage advice letters. They're uh, very direct, very hard-hitting. He makes uh, pretty emphatic statements in them like we're going to see tonight in the passage that we're going to be looking at. Uh, probably wrote them around 80, 90 to 95 is what most people think. Uh, most people think that John died around the, the age of 98. Uh, that's, that's what you'll kind of read when you kind of study about his life. Uh, die, die, only disciple that was not martyred for his faith did not die at the hands of a martyr. That he died of old age is what tradition kind of says. So uh, that makes... Um, his writing's very interesting. Um, I always think a couple of interesting things about this letter that we've kind of touched on in the introductory stuff. I'm trying as much as I can to get away from some of that because it's all stuff. I try to share with y'all some things that are maybe shared a little bit of this, but uh, not, not too much. Um, really kind of debatable what kind of letter this was. Uh, John was believed to be pastoring the church at Ephesus when he wrote this letter. Um, so many people will say that the letter was written to Christians in, in the church at Ephesus. Uh, but I think the thing that appeals to me most when I read about the background of this letter uh, is that many people now think that John was a circular letter. I mentioned that last week, uh, meant to be circulated among some of the churches of Asia Minor, um, which would parallel with the book of Revelation, the seven letters to the seven churches. All of those churches are located around Ephesus. 
Um, and so that would make sense to me that he was writing this letter uh, to encourage them and to be circulated among them. All of those churches, if you read those letters, were facing problems of their own. Um, and that's interesting to me. All of them were facing problems with false teachers coming into them in that area, all of that kind of stuff. So in this letter, there's some main themes that he talks about. Uh, one of those um, has to do with false teaching, but um, the whole letter itself, uh, the purpose for it, you know, we've said is multiple purposes because he'll say all through the letter, these things I've written to you. And so it's to strengthen believers, to help them grow in their faith, to give them assurance and all of those kind of things. But one of the themes you'll see that we haven't talked a great deal about is um, all through this first letter, John is talking about what authentic Christianity looks like. That what are the marks of a person who is a, who is a genuine believer? Um, come on in, good to see you. Uh, hey, Wes, would you mind grabbing him a copy of our study tonight? I think he probably didn't pick one of those up. Um, so... So that's interesting. We're, we're studying 1 John. So we're in the third chapter of 1 John. We'll be looking at verses 4 through 10 tonight. So if you want to look, and we've got a study outline that you're welcome to follow along with us if you want to. Um, and any of you others that are new, those things are available out on the table if you want to grab one of those uh, so you can follow along with us. So written by the Apostle John, written towards the end of John's life, uh, probably around 80, 90 to 95. John's older in years now. Um, he's already been um, exiled to the Isle of Patmos where he wrote Revelation. And now he has left Patmos in his old age and he's gone to um, Ephesus. Historically, John is called the Bishop of Ephesus because that's where he pastored. Um, and so believed that this letter was written from Ephesus. And that's what I was just kind of talking about then that um, I really kind of lean towards, uh, you know, some of the background material that says that John was probably a circular letter that would have been circulated to those same churches that the seven letters are written to. Um, so one of the themes we haven't talked about, uh, because John, again, he has that saying, these things I've written to you, um, is that he talks about the tests all through here. What, what are the signs of authentic Christianity, that a person is really a Christian? How, how can you gauge that in your life? How can you test yourself out? And we're going to talk about that a little bit tonight. I'm going to give some of those things to you. Um, through this letter, he gives some tests of authentic Christianity, some certain things that kind of become like a, a measuring stick or a, a test of, 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 of that. And, and the topic we're going to look at tonight um, is a tough one. Uh, we're going to look at 4 through 10. We're going to talk about the believer and sin, okay? And so th those things should be pretty interesting as we kind of uh, traverse through them. Um, I want to throw a couple of things out here. I always like to do this kind of as teasers uh, to get us discussing and talking a little bit. Um, you all know on Wednesday night we like, like to be a little bit more you know, open. We're home folks. We just kind of want to discuss things just a little bit. Um, a couple of quotes I want to give you um, that um, I'm calling these kind of quotes of significance. These are, are a couple of things that I've read recently. Um, never really know what to do with some of this stuff as, as I tell you guys from time to time. Uh, when I'm working on sermons or Bible studies, I, I do a lot of reading, and, and I see statistics uh, and polls and surveys of what's going on in the church, what's going on with Christians. I never really know what to do with that, um, what to make of it, because to me, it, it all has to do with who are, you, who are you surveying, who are you polling, where are you really getting all this stuff. I think some of what we see bears uh, some of this stuff out. Um, but this is an article that was written by Rod Sider, and the article caught my attention because it was the, the title of the article was The Scandal of the Evangelical Conscience, which really caught my attention. And so this is a lengthy quote. It'll be up there so you can follow along with me as I share the quote with you and just kind of hear it. We, we, we don't have to discuss it you know, on great level, but just kind of the heart of what this is saying will kind of lead into, I think, what John's talking about in the passage we're going to look at tonight. So here's a part of what this article says, and I did kind of grab hold of a large chunk of it, just, just so you could see this. That might be really hard for you guys to read, but I'm going to read it to you. So here's, here's what Rod Sider writes. Scandalous behavior is rapidly destroying American Christianity. By their daily activity, most Christians regularly, and here's the word he used, commit treason, which that's an interesting term. 
With their mouths, they claim that Jesus is Lord, but with their actions, they demonstrate allegiance to money, sex, and self-fulfillment. Um, the findings in numerous national polls conducted by highly respected pollsters like the Gallup Organization and the Barna Group are simply shocking. Gallup and Barna lament evangelical, uh, laments evangelical theologian Michael Horton hand us survey after survey demonstrating that evangelical Christians are as likely to embrace lifestyles every bit as hedonistic, materialistic, self-centered, and sexually immoral as the world in general. Divorce is more common among born-again Christians than in the general American population. That surprised me. Um, only 6% of evangelicals tithe. White evangelicals are the most likely people to object to neighbors of another race. Josh McDowell has pointed out that the sexual promiscuity of evangelical youth is only a little less outrageous than that of their non-evangelical peers. So when I read that, you can see why that would just kind of grab your attention and go, whoa, like, like where are we? And I, and I think most of us probably watch and read enough. I mean, if you read Christian material and you read... Christian magazine stuff that's out there. Some of that might not be that, sh that shocking, um, but, but do you get what he's saying in that? What is he, what's he telling us there about the ev evangelical Christianity in America, about you know, the Western church? What's, what's he telling us, do you think? I'm sorry. Okay. Yeah. What, what? 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 Just let's talk about it for a second. What you're hearing there. What that makes you think about the state of the church. What? What? What is that? Uh, okay. Okay. So, so, so Ron, you're saying that that you kind of think it's. You, are you saying you kind of see it as kind of a reflection of what's happening in the home, the, the fabric of the home? Okay, all right. Do you think the stuff that he's bearing out there is, is pretty much based on, you know, research and findings and statistics? So I don't know what to do with that for you. Um, but do you kind of, does what you see and what you hear kind of bear out some of what he's saying, do you think? Or, or you, think it's, you think that's kind of an alarmist thing and it's not as bad as that? Or, you know, where are you on that? Yeah, it is alarming. Yeah. yeah. So may, maybe just kind of a sign of the times that we're in. Yeah. As far as, I mean, the extension of, of where this thing goes, nothing surprises me, really. And, uh, you know, you have the generational sins mm -hmm. that are passed on from family to family, and, and, and the breakdown of the family, but you take, you bring those in to the next generation, and, and then they, they develop their own. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, it does. And, and I always like to try to balance it out and bring this home for us to kind of remind us of just a few things that we kind of know from Scripture. Like there's nothing new under the sun. Y'all hear me say that all the time. That sin has always been sin and it's always been around ever since the fall in the garden. Um, now, due to the 
technology that we have today due to you know social media and communication and all this maybe we're more aware of what's going on around us than we've ever been before so so it looks more pronounced to us it's always been around but i, I think um that that th that statement if it's a lengthy one that we just read um but but I think that statement's pretty, pretty disturbing to me because what he's talking about, and remember the title of the article, The Scandal of the Evangelical Conscience, he's not talking about the world, he's talking about Christians in that article. He's talking about Christian behavior and what Christians say is okay now, what Christians are doing. And I think we're going to hear John kind of talk about that tonight in the passage we're going to look at. The second quote I want to read to you is from... Uh, it is another quote from an article, and they're actually um, quoting some stuff from Barna Research Group, too. Here's this article uh, and a quote from this. Um, Jesus taught that Christians would be recognizable by their distinctive behavior, specifically by the way they love others and how their lives reflect their spiritual values and beliefs. A new report from the, from the Barna Group, a cultural analysis company in Southern California, presents research indicating that people's faith does not make much, as much of a difference as might be expected. That's interesting to me uh, when I read that, that, that there used to be a time when our faith really implied how we lived, like it, it affected decisions we made, how we talked, how we treated others, how we, how we lived our lives. And what that's saying is that it looks like people's faith does not make as much as a difference as might be expected. Um, and that's interesting. What, what do y'all think about that? Do you think that's true? Do you think many people believe it but don't live it? Do you see that kind of fleshed out evidence today? Yeah. Yeah, we don't hear many sermons on gluttony and obesity, do we? <laughs> Anymore. <laughs> Especially when you have an obese pastor, you know, it's kind of... <laughs> of course, I mean, what? You don't have to weigh but, what, five pounds over your... Uh, now for, them, for your doctor to tell you're obese, so... <laughs> yes, Denny. Yeah. Well, that company's from Southern California, but they were polling Americans. So, but yes, we do see that um, everywhere. So it's, it's very interesting. I think the passage we're going to read tonight um, from 1 John chapter 3, we're going to be in verses 4 through 10. Um, the title of tonight's study is The Believer and Sin. What do we do about our sin problem? That's kind of the crux of what John's going to talk about, okay? Okay. Um, and, and we're going to get into that tonight. So just kind of throw a couple of things out there. Um, we know that we are saved from our sin through a personal relationship with Jesus Christ and what he did for us on the cross, right? But do believers still sin? Okay, what, what do we do with that? Okay, that's, that's, that's the issue at hand that John's going to talk about some, okay? So... Um, in John's letters, again, he, he, this letter, he's dealing with false teaching that had come into the church at Ephesus that in those surrounding areas, constantly dealing with that, there were kind of blends, kind of a, a, a syncretizing of religious ideas around um, Ephesus. Um, Gnosticism was a very real thing, which uh, kind of had funky views of sin, um, like, um, well, you know, I'm not really responsible for my sin. That's my flesh, but this is my spiritual side. So some weird kind of far out ideas about some of that. Um, and so we're going to talk some about, about, about sin tonight and, and kind of what John is telling us about it. Um, Cause he's going to make some pretty powerful statements in here that are going to leave us scratching our heads and going, uh Oh, what does that do with me? I think um, there is a certain level of conviction that comes with reading scripture, God's word, and the Holy Spirit kind of speaking it to us and, and saying some things to us. So um, what do we do with our sin? Well, hopefully, like you said, we're, confess we're repenting of it, we're confessing it to the Lord and all that kinds of stuff. But, but let's, let's kind of really dig into the topic of that tonight. 
for us as believers because those statistics we just read, those statements we just read said that seem to indicate that Christians, um, their behavior isn't that different than those in the world. That today, a part of the problem with the church is that we look just like the world rather than reflecting Christ. That has to do with our behavior with sin, right? And so, uh, you, you know, what do we do? What, what in our own lives, how do we deal with the issue of sin in our, in our own lives from time to time? Um, there's about six excuses that Christians may use, and this is not an exhaustive list for, for sure, but all of this kind of leading up to the study tonight, we, we like to make excuses for our sin, okay? And, and there's about six excuses that Christians may use at times to excuse or even minimize their sin. And so you've got a whole line there, and we'll just throw some of these things out and talk about them a little bit, uh, kind of to get our heads kind of kind of moving around in the area of where I think John is going to kind of talk about some of this to give us a healthy, biblical, inspired by God understanding of it based on 1 John chapter 3 tonight. So, so here's some things you might hear. Um, just, these are just kind of, even for Christians sometimes, that now, now whether we say these things out loud or whether we just rationalize sin in our life with these things may be two different things. We may go, well, I would never say that but would you think it, okay? So think about that as we're going through this. So the first one is this, I'm just being myself. Or you could say it this way, God made me this way, right? So, so think about that. Um, maybe something that we kind of rationalize sin in our own lives with or kind of soften it down a little bit from time to time is, well, God, God made me this way. God made me with these desires. I, I can't fight it. I'm, it's just the way that I am. And we kind of throw that stuff around. Um, that's really not right. God, God never intended for you and I to be defined by sin. He didn't create us that way. We chose that, right? In the garden. Um, that's where sin came into the world. And, and, and I've always kind of thought, you know, if Adam and Eve hadn't sinned, the next folks would have, right? Um, but, but you and I need to realize, biblically speaking, theologically speaking by God's word, you were created for a relationship with a holy God. Sin was never a part of your initial makeup. Um, and to this day, it's not where your identity lies. So for us to kind of make that excuse, well, that's just the way I am, or it's just, just, just the way God made me. The truth of the matter is, and Paul states this, I believe, great verse in 2 Corinthians 5, 17. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creation. Behold, all things, you know, the old has passed away. All things have become new. Um, so, so we get that idea, right, that um, we can't use that excuse when we sin. Um, and then the second thing is what I just titled cheap grace. Um, God's grace is really um, a beautiful thing when you think about it. Um, but God's grace can be abused. Um, because of his great sacrifice, we have the opportunity to live with him forever. And we say it like this because that's how Paul said in Ephesians chapter 2 that we are saved by his grace, not by anything that we did, how good we are. We're saved by his grace and grace alone. And when you begin to kind of flesh out what grace really is, it means um, we get what we don't deserve. And many people will use grace as an excuse for sin. How do they do that? What do they, what do they say? Well, sin doesn't really matter, right? Right? because I'm covered by God's grace. Yeah, I can just ask for forgiveness. I can, I can live any way that I want to. Um, unfortunately, a lot of people misconstrue, misconstrue this beautiful gift that way. I can do whatever I want to, even if I know it's wrong, because God is a God of grace. And that's an abuse of grace. That's cheap grace. Um, and we don't preach cheap grace. Um, we may think, you know, grace is free. It didn't cost me anything, but it cost somebody something, Right? It's, it's the free, unmerited favor of God, the gift of God through Jesus Christ. So uh, that's, that's a powerful thing. Paul wrote this in Ephesians 6, 14 through 16. You don't have to look it up, but this will be um, on the board there. He said, for sin, Christian, shall not have dominion over you. For you're not under the law, but under grace. What then shall we sin because we are not under the law, but under grace? Certainly not. Do you not know that to whom you present yourself slaves to obey, you are to that one a slave 
whom you obey, whether by sinning leading to death or obedience leading to righteousness. So sin, so grace for us should never be an excuse for sin, right? That, so that's cheap grace. The third one is um, sin seems entertaining. And, and I'll stay with me on this one because this is the way sin is presented to us today and it becomes an excuse for us. Almost every form of entertainment in some way today, almost all of it seems to kind of promote sin in some way, if you think about it. You know, what, what's adverti- most advertising, what's it doing for you now? Yeah, it's it use, usually selling something and usually it's using, you know, the appeal to our flesh, to our carnal nature to attract us to that thing. And that's not always true, but, but in many cases it is uh, the way that it looks. You, it seems like it's hard to escape it today. Um, and we almost become desensitized to it, and it becomes a, kind of an excuse to us. It's just the world we live in, right? It's, it's the way entertainment is today, so we make excuses for it. Um, but God's given us everything we need to escape that temptation, to fall into that. The fourth one, um, everybody else is doing it. Well, we're not everybody else, right? Um, if you're a Christian, you're a child of God. Um, so that truth doesn't really hold true for you, but... But it's just what people do today. You know, we, we, we use the word conform. We, we easily conform. And what did Paul tell us in, in Romans chapter 12? Do not be conformed to the pattern of this world, but be transformed, right? So we're not supposed to do that. Um, the fifth one is it's not that big a deal or it's just a small sin. And this is a big kind of deep study and kind of leaning into the doctrine and study of sin itself theologically, but, but if you think about that, um, are there any small sins really? Does, does God really see sin in degrees? Now, on the earthly side of things, we might say, well, there's big sins and small sins because some sins have greater consequences for sure, right? But, but just theologically speaking, are there small sins? But we can rationalize sin pretty easily by saying, well, that's not really a big, it's just a little white lie, Right? Just stretch the truth a little bit, right? Um, so that's, and then the last one, it's my right. Uh, it's my right, right? And I, I always think about this one. Um, you and I have a, have a right pretty much to do anything we want to do. Now, whether we should or not is a whole different issue, right? But, but for a Christian, isn't that really kind of contradictory to your faith to start with, to ever claim your own rights in anything, isn't coming to Christ about dying to self, about you come to him and you make him Savior and Lord, and what does it mean for him to be Lord, except that you've surrendered all that you are to all that he is? And so it's almost like you surrender, you surrender your rights at the altar to his rights to rule over your life. Um, so, so those are just some things I wanted to throw out there as we're kind of getting started and to kind of get us thinking about, um, about sin and stuff. Now, I, I told you as we were kind of getting started tonight on this section, I'm just kind of trying to lay the, the, the groundwork for where, where we're going to be in these few verses in verses 4 through 10 of chapter 3. But um, I told you that really this letter, he's talking about what authentic faith really looks like. And, and we keep seeing him kind of banging that home. And all through the Gospel of John, he's going to give you um, these tests of authentic Christianity. And they're going to all kind of play into one of these three kind of roles, okay? So this is on your notes tonight. If you're going to write this down, because we're going to look at one of these tonight. Um, it's one, one of them is what we're going to call the moral test. Um, that's the first one, the moral test. And that equals obedience to Christ. Living, living our life in obedience to Him. Living, you know what, living by His commands. Living by what? he calls us to in scripture, living the way he tells us to in God's word. That's a big one for John. The test of an authentic Christian is that we live it. Okay, you see that? The test that your faith is real, that is that you live out your faith, that you, that you practice what he teaches us in his word. That's a big thing to John. Uh, and, and we've seen that already. You're going to really see that one tonight. That's the one we're going to lean in tonight in 1 John chapter 3. You're going to see it. The second one um, is what we call the relational test. And we've already seen this one some in what we've talked about, um, where John says to us, they'll know that you are mine if you have love for one another. You see that? So the relational test is love for others. It's like, because God is love, that ought to be reflected in us. 
that's a relational test of how real your faith is. Do you love like Jesus loves? Do you love like Christ loves? And we know, right, according to Scripture, God loves us with an unconditional love. No matter what you do, I'm going to keep loving you. And that's how we're to love. Do we? And there's this relational test. And he's already hit on this one in chapter 2. And we've talked about it some. And in part of chapter 3, he hit on it again. And then there's the, do the doctrinal test. That's the third one. And we're going to get to this one too. Um, especially when we get to the last two chapters. Um, remember, uh, one of the purposes that John wrote this, and remember, he always has this phrase, these things I have written to you. And in 1 John chapter 5, verse 13 We'll hear John say, these things I have written to you that believe on the name of the Son of God, that you may know that you have eternal life and that you may continue to do these things. And he's talking about um, doctrinally, and, and that would equal believing the truth about Christ and, and, and not, just, not just living it, but, but you believe doctrinally what he says. Your life lines up doctrinally with what he's teaching. And so those are kind of the three tests that you'll see him giving um, in this letter. Now, um, those are favorite themes of his. Um, all, all through this first letter, we're going to be looking at all three letters, so we'll get a glance at this a little bit further. But John gives that application of the moral test, and he makes it clear that a righteous life is distinguished, a genuine, authentic Christian life is, is a distinguished by how it lives. Like, how do you know? Even Jesus himself said, by their fruit, you'll know them. It's, it's by how they live. It's not just what they profess with their lips. It's, it's that moral test. It's by how they live. So what place does sin play in our life? And, and so that's, that's, a, that's a big one we want to see tonight. Now, I'm going to read the passage here, but I want you to notice something. I'm going to give this to you before um, we look at it. Again, chapter 3 of 1 John, we're going to look at verses 4 through 10. It's hard hitting, okay? But I want to point something out to you so that you see it. Um, verses 4 through 10 is really divided into two sections, and they're parallel sections. Um, the, verses, the, the first few verses, verses 4 through 7, um, is going to be restated and, and kind of um, compared to verses 8 through 10 here. And so when we read it, here's what John does, and we've already seen him do this. He'll repeat something several times so that we get it. Just, just like in this study, how every week I give you some background material to kind of get you back into it. John's going to do that in his writing. And, and here, I want you to see it when we read it, because verses 4 through 7, he's going to come back in verses 8 through 10 and reiterate, essentially, what he just said in verses 4 through 7. But here's what that does for us. It helps us to understand what he's saying. It's almost like he restates it in a way so that it becomes more clear for us, okay? Um, so uh, with that said, let's look at it. If you've got your Bible there, let's look at what John writes uh, in 1 John chapter 3, beginning in verse 4. Um, and again, pay close attention. Um, he's giving us a lot of help here to understand sin, even sin in the life of a believer, and where we ought to be. He's going to make some hard-hitting statements here that we've got to kind of grapple with, okay? Um, so here's what he says, beginning in verse 4 of chapter 3. Whoever commits sin also commits lawlessness, and sin is lawlessness. Okay, we'll come back to that because he's kind of defining sin for us there. And you know that he, capital H, he, got Jesus, was manifested to take away our sins. And in him, there is no sin. Um, whoever abides in him does not sin. And whoever sins has neither seen him or known him. Tough verse, okay? Let, let me read that again. Here's verse 6. Um, Whoever abides in him does not sin. What is he saying? Tell me that's not a convicting verse. Tell me that's not a verse we've got to grapple with. Like, what's he telling us? Is he talking about sinless perfection there? What's he saying about our lives? Because I asked you the question a minute ago, do believers still sin? And you said, and John said, Whoever abides in him, Jesus, does not sin. And whoever sins has neither seen him or known him. Question mark, question mark, question mark. What is he telling us that we need to understand? That's pretty heavy, right? So let's go on, verse 7. Little children. We've already, this is one of his favorite phrases. Who are, little, who are the little children? Who are the little children to John? 
believers, Christians, little children, let no one deceive you. He who practices righteousness is righteous, just as he is righteous. He who sins is of the devil, for the devil has sinned from the beginning. For this purpose, the Son of God was manifested or shown or came that he might destroy the works of the devil. Whoever has been born of God, here he's going to say it again. Remember, now we're into verse, verse 8 through 10, repeats what he just said in the first part. Whoever has been born of God does not sin. For his seed, capital H, the seed of Jesus, remains in him, small h, that would be the child of God. And he cannot sin because he's been born of God. In this, the children of God and the children of the devil are manifest or shown. Whoever does not practice righteousness is not of God, nor is he who does not love the brothers. Now tell me that's not a tough passage. I mean, it's tough. The stuff he's saying there is heavy. It causes us to kind of question things like, what is he teaching here? Um, I will tell you that um, there are whole denominations that have landed on a passage like this and developed certain theological bents within that denomination. Um, and that's why you can't proof text scripture. You can't take one scripture out of context and make that a test of doctrine. What does the rest of scripture? Scripture doesn't contradict itself, right? And, and so when God says things like all of sin and fall short of the glory of God, there is none righteous, no, not one. And then you read something like that. Earlier in the gospel, in, in this letter, in chapter two, we heard him say, but if you sin, you have an advocate with the father. So what did he just tell us there as a Christian? You're going to probably sin. And what did he just tell us here? If you sin, you're not mine. Do you see? So, so that's why interpretation, understanding what he's teaching becomes so important or you're going you're gonna to get off. And so I, I think that's really key for us when we look at this passage of Scripture. Not all we can really do is kind of lean into it and, and kind of begin to dissect it and understand what he's saying there. It raises a lot of questions. Um, if you're a Christian, and this says that if you're a Christian and you sin, you're not his, right? So does that mean that if you sin as a Christian, you've lost your salvation? Good question, right? Think about that. You, I, I just want y'all to understand where doctrine begins to go askew, where people get off scripturally. When you take a passage like this one and you apply that without applying all of Scripture to it or using the hermeneutical principles that we've talked about um, in here some. So uh, this, this becomes pretty serious. So I've kind of split this up somewhere we can talk about it. Uh, we're going to kind of dig into it some. We're going to look at kind of the first few verses, verses 4 through 7. We'll come back and look at verses 8 through 10 um, in the time that we have. Try to kind of dig into it some, but I do hope that you understand that in the time that we have, I try to do as good as we can with an hour, usually kind of go over that hour and still have more to say. Um, it really beckons you to dig deep into this. What's he telling us and what is he not telling us? You know, what, what inferences can we draw from this scripturally? We need the Holy Spirit's help to understand a passage like this. So, so what's he's telling us? So I want to kind of start here. Um, in verses 4 through 7, I believe that he is telling us, and this is kind of on your page, I think, that because sin is serious rebellion against God and it is totally opposed to Christ, two Christians, true Christians, do not live in sin. A word of that very carefully on your guide. I think that's what he's telling us in verses 4 through 7. Almost in summary fashion, it's in all caps there. Do you see it on your page? Because sin is serious, rebellion against God, and it is totally opposed to Christ. True Christians do not live in sin. There's a marker in there somewhere for us to see, that, that we need to see that this, okay? Um, we read statistics like that, like what we started with today, about how there's, there's so many Christians who look just like the world, who are living just like the world, who are living in sin. That raises a question in my mind. Is that what John's talking about? Are they truly Christians? If they can live there and live that kind of life, aren't they giving evidence of something, right? So, so let's kind of talk about that. So I know we just read it, but let's go back. Let's read verses four through seven again, and then let's kind of dig into this and kind of 
break it out into what, what, what it looks like he's saying here. So here's what John says, heavy stuff. And remember when we started this, he said John's on up in years. He's probably 95, something like this. This was written right before his death. It's believed he died about 98. He's an old man. He's lived a long time. One of Jesus' closest disciples. And you know, when you get, to get, old, when you get older, you just kind of say what you want to say, as harsh as you want to say it. And I kind of get that picture that that's where John is. He's just being really frank here and saying it like it is. Pretty plain spoken. Um, and we've already seen that because this is pretty heavy, but, but look at verses four through seven. Here's what he says. Whoever commits sin also commits lawlessness. We're going to talk about that here in a minute. And what, pay attention to that word because I want to hear what your translation says there. Um, whoever commits sin also commits lawlessness and sin is lawlessness. Um, John is really good about giving us the definition of sin all through the gospel, of, through, the, through this letter. Um, we'll kind of we'll pick these out as we go through. Um, but he calls sin lawlessness there, and we'll kind of flesh that out. And you know, and remember there's another one of his favorite words, know. This study is called that you may know. And so verse 5, and you know that he, Jesus, was manifested, was shown to you, came to take away our sins. We know that doctrinally, right? And in him, there was no sin. There is no sin. Jesus never sinned, right? Whoever abides in him does not sin. Now, that's a huge statement there if you need to underline that in your Bible. And whoever sins has neither seen him or known him. Little children, let no one deceive you. He who practices righteousness is righteous just as he is righteous. Now, now there, there's, again, th those are some very strong statements that he makes here that can, can, can really kind of doctrinally throw you off if you're not careful. Um, so, so let's think about this. That the first word I want to kind of pick up on is that word lawlessness. And I kind of ask you, what, what word does your Bible have there? Instead? Anybody have anything different than lawlessness? Contrary to the law. Anybody have anything different than lawlessness there? No? Everybody's reading from the same translation as me, I guess. Okay. <laughs> um, the, the Greek word there that's translated as lawlessness has a lot wider range of meaning um, than kind of what we see when we just kind of throw that word out there. But, but what Joyce mentions, the contrary to the law thing. So literally it means in rebellion to God's standard. Literally. In rebellion to God's standard. And if you read it that way, you start to understand it. Whoever commits sin also commits rebellion against God, against his standard, okay? Um, and sin is rebellion. And so that's, that's kind of where we get that idea of, you know, that I made in that first kind of statement. So um, some important truths concerning sin that John's laying out for us here, and we'll kind of use these to kind of walk through these verses, okay? The first one is this, that sin is serious rebellion against God. Now, why is that? Um, and if you look at verse 4, he essentially tells, verse, verses 4 in the first part of verse 5, um, he, he essentially tells us, um, whoever commits sin also commits rebellion or lawlessness, rebellion against God. And sin is rebellion, open rebellion against God. And you know that he, Jesus, was manifested to take away our sins, and in him there is no sin. And what is he telling us there? So just... Just think about what he's telling us. It's the very basic truth that we teach kind of as orthodox Christianity, kind of a, a very simple truth there if you just look at this. And you've got to just think about stuff doctrinally in these verses to get what he's saying. Um, who is Jesus? Who is he, Jesus, that was manifested? God in the flesh. When Jesus was born, okay, the angel told Joseph to give him a couple of names. The first name was, you shall call his name Emmanuel, for he is who? God with us. The second name was Jesus, and what did that name mean? For he will save his people from their what? Sin. It's the word we get Savior from. Saves us from our sin. The two things we know about God is that he is holy and that he cannot be around sin and that we are separated from him because of sin. 
And so when Jesus Christ came and died on a cross for us, his blood was shed. When we celebrate the Lord's Supper, we talk about his body was broken and, and we accept him into our life. He becomes the perfect sacrifice for our sin. And God looks at us through the blood of Christ. Are we still sinners? But our sin is covered by the blood of Christ. That does not give us an excuse to sin. We are to live in that walk with him. And that ought to change how we live every single day. And so we recognize that we're in rebellion against God, that, that, that we are sinners and cannot save ourselves. And we recognize there's only one who can save us and we cry out to him to save us. And if you look at verses four and five, John in a nutshell is explaining to you exactly what the gospel's about when Jesus came. He's, he's picturing that for us. He, he wants us to understand that. Um, and, and that's in true, in very, very true. So John may not have in mind so much the specific breaking of God's law, but rather he's saying that the one who practices sin is in rebellion against God still. And that if you, as, as a person who professes to be a Christian, can continue to live a life of sin, you're giving indication that you've never truly been saved. You've never truly understood who Jesus is, why he came, and why you can't be in relationship with God apart from him and what he's done for you. There's, there's a separation because he is holy. So, so that's a very important picture that we get there. A uh, great old preacher of the past, J.C. Riley, points out, and this is really interesting. This quote's up here on the screen so you can look at it because it's not on your page. And he says this, that a right knowledge of sin lies at the root of all saving Christianity. If a man does not realize the dangerous nature of his soul's disease, you cannot wonder if he's content with false or imperfect remedies. And think about what he's saying there. That, that, that if we don't recognize what sin does to us and what God did for us on our behalf, have we really ever come to understand what it really means to be saved and, and to be in right relationship with him? So, so that's, that's really true if you think about it. Um, now, False teachers that John was confronting were no doubt, as many false teachers in our day are, minimizing the seriousness of sin. That, that they were minimizing it. And so John is saying, listen, an authentic Christian doesn't live a life that's characterized by sin anymore. Um, I've shared with you before, uh, you know, quote from Adrian Rogers where, you know, he talks about, um, I am not sinless, but I have a desire to sin less. And, and that's a part of that. Why, why does that happen in the life of a Christian? Why is it that in the life of a Christian, sin ought to bother you? What happens to us? We have something living inside of us that doesn't let you get away with it. Right? You got the Holy Spirit if you're a believer. And when you sin, what happens? Conviction. Right? All of a sudden, the Holy Spirit begins to stir in you. There's an uneasiness in you. You begin, do you see what I'm saying? You pick up God's word, you begin to read it, and all of a sudden, it hits you right between the eyes, and you just kind of go, uh-oh. Preacher's preaching, and all of a sudden, my toes feel like you've just been stepped on. That's not the preacher, right? What is that? that, that that's the Holy Spirit. And, and John's also the one that said, if, if you don't have the Holy Spirit, you are not his, Right? So there's this confirmation. It's all, all of that kind of is a part of what he's talking about here. So I think we need to, we need to think about that. Um, I want to throw this in here, and this is kind of just a little subset in the middle of this point. But, but what is, what's Satan's strategy in all of this? Um, what was Satan doing in the garden to God's most prized creation, Adam and Eve, man? What did he do? Tempted them to rebel against God, Right? Did God really say, tempted them to doubt God's word, to rebel against what God told them to do? God knows that if you eat that fruit, your eyes will be open and you will be like God, like God's trying to keep something from you. What did he tempt them to do? To sin, which is rebellion against God, to rebel against God. His strategies never change, but, but here's what I want you to think. This is a part of Satan's strategy for us. Um, Satan's strategy has always been to get rebellious man to think more highly of himself than he ought to think. I always say it like this. You and I must never forget that we're above falling and falling hard. We are. 
we ought to humbly approach God. The only way your sins are forgiven is because of Jesus, not because of something you've done. Um, the only way you experience the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ is not because you go to church more than anybody else, or you read your Bible more than anybody else, or you tithe more than anybody else. That isn't it. The only way that you're anything is not because you're something, but it's because of the God that you serve as something. Right? So, so that's his strategy, is, is to give us, get us to think more highly of ourselves than we ought to think. Um, the truth of the matter is when we come into God's presence, we ought to be humbled on our faces by who he is. Um, second, at the same time, Satan gets us to pull God down from his absolute holiness to make, to make it not a big deal to him. Um, sin is a big deal to God. God has given evidence to us that he doesn't hate us because of our sin. God demonstrates his love for us and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us, all right? That's Romans 5, 8. We, we, know that, we know that great passage of Scripture. Um, but but, but God, doesn't, God doesn't hate us because we sin. He loves us in spite of our sin, and he pays for our sin himself. Um, he paid the cost for us. Um, we say things like, surely a loving God understands that I'm only human. Right? Surely a loving God understands that I'm going to mess up sometimes. Um, he, wouldn't, he wouldn't send anybody to hell. We, we think like that sometimes. He, he wouldn't demand perfect righteousness from anyone. That's exactly what he demands. And that's why he sent his son. That's why God became a man and dwelt among us and paid a price for our sin. And he calls us to be holy as he is holy, right? And those are powerful calls. So, so, so think about that, that first kind of statement there, sincere rebellion against God. He tells us that in, in verse Four, especially, but four, four and five. Second, sin is totally opposed to Jesus Christ. We have to understand that. Um, in verse five, look at it there. It says, and you know that he, Jesus, was manifested to take away our sins, and in him there is no sin. You know, when we make that doctrinal statement, there's only one man who ever lived that never sinned, it's true. Jesus never sinned. He lived a perfect life holy, set-apart life. He is our sample, our example of what we were to be. John's readers knew this, but he reminds them of it again. Jesus appeared to take away our sins. That's the same verb as when John the Baptist saw Jesus and proclaimed, behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. Same word, which is very interesting to me. Um, John uses that word manifest. Um, and, and I've kind of been kind of, kind of fleshing that out for you and kind of have replaced it, amplified it as we're reading um, where, where it says there, and you know that he was manifested, um, revealed to us is the picture, seen by us. And, and here's the thing that that really drives home. Notice that word. It is not saying that you saw him, that you found him. What's it saying? He was revealed to you. And that's important because, because there's nothing you and I do to save ourselves. Nothing you and I do to, to find forgiveness ourselves. So that, that's the picture that he's giving us. So sin's totally opposed to Jesus Christ. The only way that he could do this was to be completely sinless himself to pay for our sins. So John adds, in him there was no sin. Jesus was virgin born through the Holy Spirit, preserved him from original sin, he lived a complete obedience to God so that even his enemies could not convict him of sin. He offered himself as a lamb of God, spotless, unblemished, as the final and complete sacrifices for our sins. And if you know those truths, then John's conclusion is inescapable. Um, and, and you get that. So that's the second one. Third one, and this is in verses six and seven, true Christians don't live in sin. We may sin but we don't live in sin. A true Christian has the Holy Spirit dwelling within him, and if he sins, he will be an extremely unhappy and uncomfortable Christian. Therefore, he cannot live there. And that's a very important statement to understand. So, so here's what he says. Whoever abides in him does not sin. Whoever sins has neither seen him nor known him. 
Little children, let no one deceive you. He who practices righteousness is righteous just as he is righteous. Okay? Now, let's flesh that out a little bit. What does it mean to abide? John would say in John chapter 15, if you abide in me, if you abide in me, you will have much joy. He who abides in me has much joy, right? If you abide in me and my word abides in you, I'll ask what you will, it will be done for you. Abiding has to do with an intimate connection that we have with him. It's really a, a word that has to do with having a personal relationship with him, that we abide in him, we know him, we've come to know him. And the only reason we, we, the only way we come into a personal relationship with God is through his son, Jesus Christ. Um, if you go back all the way to the Garden of Eden, where it all began and where that relationship was broken because of sin, if you remember, there was, God created man and he was in perfect fellowship with him. Perfect unity. Every day, the Bible gives us this picture that he would come down in the cool of the evening and he would be with man. And we get that picture. But then something happened and they hid from God all of a sudden. Remember that? Sin happened and all of a sudden the relationship was destroyed. Something happened to the abiding. Okay, that, that, that abiding in him. And, and from the book of Genesis all the way till we get to the birth and life of Christ at the end of the book, the whole book is a book of redemption. Whose redemption? Ours. We talk about how through the Bible there's this scarlet thread. That's a blood thread, right? There's a scarlet thread that runs through the Bible, and all of it is pointing to Jesus Christ, who would redeem mankind to a relationship with God that we might abide in him, that we might be with him. And the one, he says, John says here, you know, the one who abides in him doesn't sin. It doesn't mean that he never sins. It means he can't stay there. His sin's been paid for, and if he sins, he's uncomfortable with it, and he confesses it. Um, and th that becomes a very powerful truth when you read this. Um, there's a couple of truths here that I think we need to get from these two verses, and I can give these things to you. So true Christians do not live in sin. Here's a couple of truths. Anyone living in sin is not abiding in Christ and has not seen or known him, according to what he says. Um, again, there's that favorite word of John's, the word to know. Um, having a relationship with Christ is more than just knowing about him. It's, it's knowing him. It's being in relationship with him. The idea that there are two types of Christians, those who abide in him and do not sin, and those who do not abide in him and do not sin is unthinkable to the apostle, John. That's not what he's saying. He, what he's saying is that if you're in relationship through Jesus Christ and you're abiding in him, and then, then you have seen him and you know him, so you're not going to be comfortable in sin. When you're in the presence of holiness, you'll never be comfortable in sin. And that, that's an important truth that we see. The false teachers claim that to have special revelation or knowledge of Christ, John says that their sinful lives betrayed them. Um, his point is that anyone who knows Jesus Christ as the holy, sinless Savior who came to offer himself on a cross to forgive our sins does not live in the sin that crucified him. It, it bothers us. Um, when you look at the cross and you realize he took my sin, I drove the nails in his hand. I pressed the crown. What does that do to us? It causes deep sense of conviction about our role in crucifying the Savior. And that has to do with our relationship with him. So anyone living in sin doesn't abide. And then he says this, don't be deceived. A true Christian practices righteousness just as Jesus is righteous. Now, let's kind of flesh that out on what he's saying. There's a lot of different ways to define righteousness. And one of my favorites is the one we've talked about in here quite a bit. What, is, what does it mean to be righteous? What is righteousness? And I've given you this simple definition. It means right relatedness to God. Being rightly related to God. How do you get rightly related to God? How do you and I get rightly related to God? Well, if I go to church, God will like me more. Nope. You know, if I have Baptist by my name, God will like me more. Nope. Do you know what I'm saying? How do you get rightly related to God? Through Jesus Christ. Through a personal relationship with him. 
We're not made righteous with God by our own righteousness, only through his righteousness. Now read it that way. Who, he who practices righteousness is righteous. He who practices being rightly related to God, he who lives out that way, being rightly related to God, what's that going to do to sin in your life? You can't live in it. If you're practicing being, every single day you're practicing being rightly related to God, what's it going to do? God, what do you think about this thing that I just said? What do you think about this thing I just participated in? If you're practicing that, how are you going to live in sin? That, that, that's a powerful truth, what he's saying there. Um, so he who practices righteousness is, is, is righteous. Is the one who practices living rightly is, is going to be rightly related to him. They're going to strive for that, just as he, Jesus, is rightly related to the Father. We, we strive for that. So, so that's, that's pretty powerful when you, when you think about what he's te teaching there. Don't be deceived. He says a true Christian practices righteousness, just as Jesus is righteous. That's, I, why am I moving so slow? All right, here we go. Verses 8 through 10. Um, here's the second statement I want to make about this. So remember I said verses 4 through 7, verses 8 through 10 is parallel. And it's almost like one's implying on the other, kind of helping us to understand what he's saying there. So, so kind of second thought here is that because of the devilish origin of sin and the purposes of Christ's coming, his appearing, manifesting himself, true Christians cannot live in sin. That's that's what we see in verses 8 through 10, where he reinforces that idea. A true Christian can't live in that. Why? Because you have him in you. Because you, you have the Holy Spirit in you. Sin is going to convict you. You're going to be convicted, right? If you're practicing living in relationship with him. So in verses 8 and 10, he says this. He who sins is of the devil. He's giving you a picture of what the enemy looks like. For the devil has sinned from the beginning. For this purpose, the Son of God was shown. There's the same idea we read in the first part of this. Was shown, was manifested, that he might destroy the works of the devil. What was the purpose in Jesus' coming? What was Satan doing in the garden? Causing man to sin, rebel against God. What was the purpose in Jesus' coming? To destroy what sin had done to us. To wipe it out. That's that's what old John's telling us, okay? That, that's what he wants us to see here when we look at that. He was manifested that he might destroy the works of the devil. And whoever is born of God doesn't, doesn't sin. It doesn't mean he's never going to commit a sin in his life. It means he's, he's not going to be able to live there. Why? Look what it says. For his seed remains in him. Whose seed? The seed of salvation has been planted in you through Jesus Christ. The seed of him, and he cannot sin because he is born of God. In this, the children of God and the children of devil are manifest. Whoever does not practice righteousness is not of God, nor is he who does not love his brother. So, so very powerful. Some points here concerning this. I'll run through these really quickly just to give this to you. Sin is serious because it originates from the devil. That's what he told us in, in verse 8. It's serious because it came from God's enemy who seeks to destroy us. Got a whole bunch of stuff that we could go into. Don't have time. Number two, sin is totally opposed to the purpose of Christ's coming to destroy the works of the devil. When we understand that, it changes how we even look at it. Third, a true Christian does not and cannot live in sin. That's in verses 9 and 10. Okay. Let me see here. Two points about not living in sin. I'll give these to you. I'm trying to get you where your page is full at least, all right? A true Christian does not and cannot live in sin because God's seed is in him and he's born of God. He's his now, okay? And then the other one, I want to get to the end here. We're almost there. The, chi the, chi uh, the children of God and the children of the devil are distinguished by the practice of righteousness and love, living rightly related to him. A person who is striving to live rightly related to him what happens when they sin? They're convicted of it. How do you practice living rightly related to God? How do you know how to live rightly related to him? If you are pursuing righteousness, if you're pursuing living rightly related to him, what's going to have to be a part of your life? This book, right? That's going to teach us and train us in how to live rightly related to him. Communion with him through prayer. You know, 
how do you get to know him? How do you learn what it means to be rightly related to? Him? How can you relate to somebody you never talked to? Right? Do, do you see? Sitting under the preaching, teaching of his word, the body of believers, the church of the Lord Jesus Christ that is his bride, his hands, his feet. All right? And there's way more that I can share with you. I'm going to give you these final steps uh, that you can take to keep from falling into sin. Um, and these are just helpful things, I think, for a Christian um, that might be helpful for us every single day. I think you could also subtitle these, um, How to Practice Righteousness in Your Life, Right Relatedness to Him. Number one, set boundaries that help you honor your relationship with God. Uh, make a covenant with your eyes, your ears, your hands, you know, your mind. So set boundaries that help you honor your relationship with God. Second, learn to love what God loves. Learn to love what God loves. That's big for us. Um, if, if every single thing that kind of came into our life is, you know, is this something that's going to honor God? And does God love this? If he doesn't love it, I don't want it to be a part of my life. So learn to love what he loves. These are just practical steps. The third one, um, treasure grace. Don't abuse it. Treasure grace. Respect grace. You get what you don't deserve. Treasure that. That's a gift. Third, add prayer to your list. This is four. Add prayer to your list of practical ways to avoid temptation. Jesus told his disciples... And by that, he told us, watch and pray that you enter not into temptation. Simple verse, right? Watch and pray that you enter not into... I think that's some of the most simple practical advice he ever gave his disciples. Watch and pray that you enter not into temptation. So add prayer to your practical ways to avoid temptation. Fifth, ask God to help you fully embrace his definition of what it means to be righteous, set apart, and holy. And live there. Think about that. What he's called us to. He's called us to righteousness, to be rightly related to him. What is that going to look like in my life? That's certainly going to dictate what I do and don't do, right? Think about what it means when he tells us to be set apart for his purposes. I am not my own. I'm bought with the price. Therefore, glorify God with your body and your spirit, which are his. You get that? So, so we, we've been set apart for his purposes, not for our own. Not, not to please ourselves, and then that last one, be holy. What does it mean to be holy? Well, it does mean to be set apart for his purposes, right? But we're told to be holy because he is holy. Holiness is a very big struggle for us because we're just not. But it's certainly something we're supposed to strive for. And the sixth one is this, and I think this is good. Think this way. Would God be honored by how I'm representing him? Would he be honored? I think that will change um, how we live our lives every single day in regard to sin. Right. Okay, guys, I'm sorry. I, I always feel like I have to skip so much good stuff. But thank you guys for coming tonight. That's, that's just kind of a quick run through of 1 John 3, 4 through 10 and kind of digging in a little bit to what, what John's talking about there. And we'll kind of continue on this line next week as we continue. Again, let me reiterate this. If you're interested in this study... Remember, you can go back on our live stream that's on our face, church Facebook page, and you can watch the previous weeks as we've worked through 1 John. You can also download the manuscripts on our website. You might have to dig around in there a little bit to find it, but all of the manuscripts from all the studies we've ever done are on there. Uh, you can print them off and you'll have them beyond what these notes say. So if you want more, a lot of that stuff's out there for you. Okay, thank you guys for coming tonight. Let me lead us in a word of prayer. And we will be dismissed tonight. Father, thank you uh, for this time, this opportunity to be in your word. Uh, thank you for um, uh, your Holy Spirit uh, teaching us, guiding us through this time together. Lord, I pray that, God, just the little bit of time we have to dig into passages like this that are so rich and deep and full of truth, God, I pray it would just whet our appetites to dig deeper. Uh, God, to probe the depths of your word and what you're teaching us about ourselves and how to live in relationship with you. I pray that, God, tonight, as we've looked at this passage of Scripture, God, it would be humbling for us before you. Um, God, it, it would cause us, Father, to give thanks for your amazing grace that you poured out in our life. Um, God, that you took the initiative 
in manifesting yourself, showing yourself to us, drawing us to yourself and saving us. God, help us to live um, every day rightly related to you. And God, in such a way that it might bring honor and glory to your name. And God, that it might speak to the hope that we have in Jesus. Help us as yours to hold out the word of truth, the gospel message to those who don't know you and are lost. Dismiss us in your grace tonight. It's in your name we ask these things. Amen.